Hello and welcome to Frontline. I am Obiora Ilo. On Tuesday, the people of the United States of America went to the polls to elect a president that will call the shots for another four years. It was a tough battle as opinion polls had the two candidates, Mitt Romney and Barack Obama, enjoying the same percentage of acceptability till the morning of the election. However, a few hours after the polls closed, to the surprise of many, President Barack Obama had enough electoral votes to be declared the winner, a phone call from Mitt Romney and a concession speech. I have just called President Obama to congratulate him on his victory. His supporters and his campaign also deserve congratulations. I wish all of them well, but particularly the President, the First Lady, and their daughters. This is a time of great challenges for America, and I pray that the President will be successful in guiding our nation. The nation, as you know, is at a critical point. At a time like this, we can't risk partisan bickering and political posturing. Our leaders have to reach across the aisle to do the people's work. And we citizens also have to rise to the occasion. We look to our teachers and professors. We count on you not just to teach, but to inspire our children with a passion for learning and discovery. We look to our pastors and priests and rabbis and counselors of all kinds to testify of the enduring principles upon which our society is built. Honesty, charity, integrity, and family. We look to our parents. From the final analysis, everything depends on the success of our homes. We look to job creators of all kinds. We're counting on you to invest, to hire, to step forward. And we look to Democrats and Republicans in government at all levels to put the people before the politics. I believe in America. I believe in the people of America. For the winner, Barack Obama, it was not just celebrating the victory, but a time to bring Americans together and a time to challenge all Americans to go to work because there is so much work to be done. Now, we will disagree, sometimes fiercely, about how to get there. As it has for more than two centuries, progress will come in fits and starts. It's not always a straight line. It's not always a smooth path. By itself, the recognition that we have common hopes and dreams won't end all the gridlock or solve all our problems or substitute for the painstaking work of building consensus and making the difficult compromises needed to move this country forward. But that common bond is where we must begin. So, so much for us to learn as a country and a continent from the Americans. And we say congratulations to all Americans and President Barack Obama for a victory well deserved. Today in our program, we'll be looking at the challenges of effective health care delivery in Nigeria and the efforts of government to confront it. In a moment, I'll be speaking with the Honorable Minister of Health, Professor Onyebu Chichuku. Also on our program today, we'll be joining the conversation on constitution review and true federalism. And later on in our segment, in your own words, our guest will be Dr. Okwesile Zenwodo, former governor of Enugu State and former chairman of the PDP. And joining me to discuss the challenges of effective health care in Nigeria is the Honorable Minister of Health, Professor Onyebuchi Chuku. Uh, Professor Chuku, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Well, uh, a, a, a look at your website says Nigeria happens to be in the era of transformation, and this can only be achieved if all hands are on deck. This was what you said. Right. <laughs> what did you mean by that? Well, health it's not something that um, only the Minister of Health would uh, have to grapple with. Uh, what we are simply saying is that for health to be what will meet our expectation, then everybody, every citizen, every tier of government, um, every sector, whether it's public or private sector, must participate. 
I, I always like to tell people something that probably the mistake is from those who coined the term Ministry of Health. Probably we should be better referred to as the Ministry of Health Services. Because actually health in itself is the overall outcome of everything in the economy. And everything in pass on health. Uh, let me just give you an example. If someone is not paid his salary, if you are not paid your salary today, you're going to have some health problems. And if you get to hospital and your problem becomes complicated, the health minister gets blamed. Nobody remembers the fellow who, uh, whose lapse is led to you're not getting your salary. So that's what we mean by all hands must be on deck. And, 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 and so people must begin to appreciate that for us to enjoy good health, it may involve so many sectors of the economy. It could involve power, for instance. Uh, there are things that if power is not adequate, will obviously affect your health. It could be water resources. It could be agriculture. People are not getting the right quantity and the quality of food that ought to offer nutrition to them. Obviously, they were affected. So, in a way, uh, we are at the end of a spectrum, a spectrum that begins with education, because everything depends on education. The fact that I'm a doctor or even a minister is because I'm educated. So everything depends on education. The fact that you can arrange this kind of program, and we're on air, all the uh, 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 experts who are making this possible uh, for people to see this program and listen to us, they got education. That is the end, the beginning of that spectrum. But it goes through a process, so many things in the economy, the final outcome is what you call health. Okay, Honorable Minister. Um, recently, uh, one of our governors had an, an accident, an air crash. And um, two days after, he was flown abroad. What is the problem with our health facilities? If we still have to rely on India, America, Germany for our health uh, uh, problems, and economy, e economists are saying that we're losing so much money. So what is the problem with our health facilities? Well, let me start with a general preamble uh, by saying that there are many reasons why someone may have to leave his or her country to go seek health care. And uh, basically, uh, we're a developing country, and it's not only health. Uh, I don't know how many things in this room are being manufactured in Nigeria. We we'll import them. Why should we go out to import equipment for television? I ask you, for instance. Why can't we manufacture it here? So it is the level of our development. So having said that, what we've tried to do in the health sector is to see that as much as possible, we should be able to handle what is in the health sector. Now, that is not to deny people their human rights. The fact that someone goes abroad does not automatically mean that the condition could not be handled in country. And it's so clear, I've already told people, there are people in this federal capital territory who still go to Lagos, who still go to Enugu, who go to Abakaliki for their health care. It's just out of preference. Probably that is where the doctor they are used to have always been. The second thing is there's this affection for something that is foreign. And it's not only limited to health. I've said this several times. I know people, I've talked to people who send their clothes for dry cleaning abroad. It doesn't mean that there are no dry cleaners in Nigeria. But again, there's a patient for foreign tests. Again, that does not mean the situation is here. So certainly, to answer your question, yes without breaching patient's confidentiality. All I will say that the fact that that governor was taken out does not necessarily mean it could not have been, have been handled and in the And a country. lot of people thought that with the, um, the high profile nature of that um, accident and what happened after it, that probably those in authority would have insisted that National Hospital, which was, is one of our best, should have handled it. No. After they stabilized you it. You cannot insist. Just like you now, if you go to a doctor, I'm a doctor, if you consulted with me, I made a diagnosis, and I tell you this is what I'm going to do. Your next question is, doctor, can you handle it? I say yes. And then you come back the next day with your relatives and friends and say you want to go abroad. Now, it is not my money. It is fundamental human right. Every Nigerian citizen has an inalienable right to go seek for health care any part of the world. Just like those in America. We've been treating patients who come from abroad here. They prefer to come home. It all depends on, on the patient. On the patient. Okay. But we're, what I've said as Minister of Health is that we're working on strengthening the policy, and we're going to do that. If something can be treated in Nigeria, and you're a public officer, 
then we don't have to use public funds to support your treatment. I don't know where you're getting the point I'm making. Okay. We should never use public funds to support the treatment of something that is available here. That is what we're working for. How do we determine for. that? We are working on the process. I don't want to uh, say uh, so much, mm -hmm. but the process will be such that at a certain level, we maybe have to require the minister to put in writing that, yes, he has investigated, and this condition, either because of skill or facility, cannot be satisfactorily treated in Nigeria. Okay, then, Honorable uh, Minister, uh, let's look point. at uh, the challenges of our health care delivery in Nigeria. You know, appropriate and adequate equipped medical facilities, trained personnel, are very important. Yeah. And in the course of this program, we, we spoke to Nigerians, and a lot of them are saying that medical care in Nigeria is not accessible. Where it's accessible, it is not affordable. Well, there are some forms of accessibility. One is geographical, okay? It is possible that maybe because there are no means of transportation or they are far, okay? In some, Nigeria is quite large. In some states that are very large geographically, um, the health centers, whether they are private or they are government-owned, are so far apart that sometimes it's quite far for our citizens to get to them. That is what we call geographical inaccessibility. Mm -hmm. Then there's the, of course, one you've alluded to, the financial inaccessibility. Is it service affordable? Now, certainly we are working on that. What can be done? I'm proposing, and we're communicating that, that now that we're thinking of reviewing our constitution for a second time, probably two things can be done to ensure what I call, or what is known as universal health coverage. What is universal health coverage? Universal health coverage is providing quality health care that is affordable to everyone. So you're addressing equity. Now, how can we achieve that? One is the payment options. Right now, 70% of Nigerians have to pay for health care out of their pocket. And when we calculated it the last time, it rose into several billions that if we put this kind of money, the kind of facilities in, in terms of number and in terms of quality, I mean, will be much improved. But we're all going as individuals and spending out of pocket. Now, what is the problem with spending out of pocket? It is not reliable because at the time you have a major A health, what you have in your pocket may not often be sufficient to cater for it. So it's not reliable. It is not something we can predict. So it's not in. What is the reliable one? Everyone agrees that it's some kind of health insurance. So if we can make in their constitution that health insurance is mandatory, is compulsory. I mean, for vehicles, it is so. If you have any kind of vehicle that you go for, it's mandatory. That's what our law says. Are you saying How that much more for a human being? Are you saying that the NHI Yes, it's, it's, not not it's not effective. No, no, NHS, I will not say it's not effective because first you have to understand what is the NHS. The so you are saying that it's scheme. not mandatory. It was never the law. The law says that it was optional. You are looking for one that should be mandatory. Yes, for because every individual. Because why? Why do we make vehicles mandatory and not voluntary? So if we can take people's right and say, let's make. I'm saying that like uh, countries that are we are trying to emulate. Even developing countries, some of them, uh, like countries like um, Thailand, countries like uh, Vietnam, in those countries, health insurance is mandatory. In, the, in, in their own case, if you even put it in their constitution, we should do likewise. Then, to ensure that universal health coverage, what's the other amendment we need to do? We need to go to the schedules and say, it is the responsibility of, say, the state governments to ensure that within a certain distance, we don't need to be in a hurry. We start in a modest way and progress. We can stay with five kilometers. I would like a situation where within two kilometers you have a health facility, but we can start gradually. Five kilometers is okay. So within five kilometers there should be a health facility. It doesn't matter who owns that health facility. It could be the federal government, it could be the state government, it could be the local government. It could even be the private sector. It doesn't matter, but the state should ensure that within five kilometer radius of any citizen or any resident of Nigeria, you have a health facility. With these two measures, then it becomes both geographical and financially financial. affordable. No, financial <laughs> accessible. Accessi uh, uh, financially yes. accessible. Yes. Okay, yes. you talked about the tertiary institutions, and, and what comes to mind is the university teaching hospitals all over the country. Our investigations show that, as we speak now, in some teaching hospitals, 
nurses and doctors at night treat patients with touch lights because you don't have um, uh, standby uh, alternative power supply and um, they don't have the funds to keep uh, buying diesel to maintain these facilities. Federal teaching hospitals? The federal teaching hospitals. Like which one? A couple of them. No, name them because uh, there's none, I can tell you confidently. So if someone is not doing his duty, we have taken care of that. We have bystand, uh, 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 standby, generator. uh, uh, standby generators. If there's any of them, that is your duty also to help us as media. You give that information to the minister, we confirm and we take action. What kind of funding do they have? Well, funding comes from both internal generator revenue and from what is provided directly as subvention to them. It may never be enough, but there's no place in the world, go and ask anybody, there's nobody that's ever said that funds are sufficient, nobody, even the developed countries. But what is important is how do you manage the little you're having, okay? The federal hospitals get a lot more money than many of the state-owned hospitals. I've run a state-owned hospital. And we're able to even make them more functional than a lot of the federal hospitals. So what is important is management. Because you will never have enough funds to do anything. So forget it. It's, it's an utopian situation. It's never. Because the more you start seeing funds, the more your dreams become wider. Your vision extends. And what you want to do, you become more ambitious. So you never get to that, whether in personal life or in corporate life. But what is important is that whether in personal life or corporate life, whatever you can get, you should be able to manage it more efficiently. You have a system of monitoring. We have a system I mean, of monitoring. You funded the So I've never got in recent times this kind of complaint. I'm not <laughs> maybe, aware. Maybe the next time we are going to no, have No, just let us know because we'll I can tell you confidently, Nigeria, if it's a federal teaching hospital, that has not happened in the last one year. How do you monitor? We don't monitor. We have a department that has an inspectorate uh, division, uh, the Department of uh, Hospital Services. We also ask people to inform us, okay? Now, there are many methods of informing us, but what we want to do now is to centralize. Before my predecessor left office, he embarked on a scheme where we wanted to have a central number that can even make it possible for a patient or patient relative to complain in any of our federal hospitals so that the minister will even know. We are resustained that, we are holding meetings uh, with the networks, and very soon we will resustain that. Okay, um, Honorable Minister, we'll take a break. When we return, we'll look at um, the other things that are impeding effective health delivery in Nigeria. Don't go away. Frontline continues. Well, I wouldn't say it is accessible, you know, affordable because of the uh, cost, the inflation, inflation cost in Nigeria. There's a lot, uh, a lot of uh, uh, high price of medication, you know, medicine and even consultation. So I can't say it is affordable. To a very large extent, healthcare is accessible, but there is not much information to let people know where to go and at what point to go. But when you talk about affordable, I would disagree about affordable. It's not quite affordable here in Nigeria. Uh, yes, um, with regards to healthcare in Nigeria, I would say that even though government is trying, but government is not able to do sufficient. So um, there should be some complementary effort, you know, such so, so that um, healthcare should be brought, you know, to the doorsteps of the common man. They need, they need to some improve, some improvement on healthcare services. Government is not sincere about this uh, health insurance. People don't trust the, you know such organizations again because of the you know corruption in Nigeria. Otherwise the health you know insurance would have been the absolute solution to health care. Welcome back to Frontline. My guest is still the Honorable Minister of Health, Professor Onyebuche Chukwu. Recently you engaged some doctors in diaspora. And I've also interacted with some doctors in diaspora and, and they've expressed some fear about coming home either to work for government or establish their own hospitals. They've talked about the high cost of doing business in Nigeria. They've also talked about corruption where they have to, I mean, I mean, uh, bribe to get things done in the country. In your engagement, was there any way you reassured them with specific no, for uh, me, I'm a practical man. Yeah. Uh, anybody that says he can't come back to his country is not ready for some reasons. Some people say it's economic. Many yeah. people left the choice of Nigeria purely from the economic point of view. If someone is paying you better 
You move. It's not restricted to medicine. It's everywhere. Even you yourself, if someone pays you better tomorrow, you'll be tempted to move. So it's difficult to convince anybody that someone is paying you two times when you convert the money in Naira, it becomes three or four times and for you to come back uh, in country to work. But if you want to come back, assuming you have sorted out basic problems like you've trained your children, you've built a house in your village, that's what I tell them outside. And you're generally comfortable with the basic necessities of life and you now want to do better by now helping your society. You then return the opportunities when you come back. But if you are going to come back to complain, then you're not ready to work for your country. The place you're running to, America, remove 100 years from the health sector. They had nothing. 100 years ago in America, do you know how you, need, how you become a doctor? If you train under Professor Sonia Bushichuku, it's like apprenticeship. When I'm happy with you, you can buy things for my wife. She sends you to market and all that, and you are an obedient guy. I look at you, you are doing well, you've learned a few things. I give you a certificate, a testimony, and I do what Nigeria used to call freedom. That is 100 years. Just remove 100 years from America today. Look at where America is. Why cannot people desire to get their country that way? You're talking about corruption. Who is accusing who? Corruption starts from even at home. Go and see what uh, parents are doing at their home. Is that not corruption? It's not only one government that is corruption. Look at the private sector. Right now, as a minister, I'm, is, sometimes I no longer know what to say. I used to think the private sector was better. But now with recent revolution, private sector is not even better in terms of corruption. But so what is the point? The point is that corruption is something the individual has to fight by himself. The country will make laws and enforce those laws. But it's the individual right from home, even in the religious bodies, there's corruption. Uh, uh, so uh, people should stop telling me about honorable corruption. Honorable minister, are you, make, are no, you, making, are you going no, a step Are you going a step No, no. Uh, what I want us is, I want us in Nigeria to remove certain things. There are certain words we use in Nigeria that I think we should just discard and get on with the business. One is this idea of corruption. If someone is corrupt, report the person. If someone says, give me bribe, refuse to give bribe. For goodness sake, I report that. But you are frustrated. Don't get frustrated. There's nothing. You pay a price for anything. Look at Americans. They were queuing up for hours. If it's in Nigeria, they'll be attacking INEC. Nobody's attacking Americans. But they queued up. They queued up. Till 12 hours, people were queuing up in the sun to foot. So on, the, on the 24th of October, the Federal Executive Council approved the pharmacovigilance policy. A lot of Nigerians really don't understand what this means. How okay. can you break it down? Uh, pharmacovigilance simply means um, the science of... Um, prevention, assessment um, of um, safety of drugs. Now, you know the issue with drugs is that often there's hardly any drug that you give that does not have side effects. And some of these side effects can actually be very severe that they can even lead to death. We call all of them adverse drug reactions. So the monitoring, the evaluation, the assessment, the identification, the understanding, the prevention of these adverse drug effects is what is known as pharmacovigilance. Yes, the country has now a policy that has been approved by the Federal Executive Council of Pharmacovigilance. So we are putting a framework, a policy as it were. How can we ensure that we monitor the effects of drugs? Now, there are two ways. One is what we call pre-marketing and one is the post-marketing. Now, pre-marketing means before any drug is introduced anywhere in the world, for public use. It has to undergo what is known as clinical trials and the number of phases, at least three phases, in some cases even a fourth phase. That is pre-marketing. Now, even at that, while we are doing clinical trials, we do understand a few of the adverse drug reactions, but you will never be able to know everything completely. So there's need to continue to monitor possible adverse reaction even after the drug has come into clinical use. That's what we call post-marketing. So that's what pharmacovigilance is all about. I can't end this program without asking you how you engage in the private sector. The administration of Dr. Goodlord Jonathan has come to the conclusion, which has been conclusion of many government, but now something is being done, that obviously certain kinds of health care may never be able to be provided the ordinary Nigerian in terms of geographic and you know, accessibility and so on, unless the private sector is encouraged. And therefore, we are trying to in, in, in encourage investors by government saying, no, we don't have to always build a hospital. In any case, many times when we are built, it, people decide to go on strike and eventually people make the place inefficient because they think it belongs to government and nobody should be able to get value for money. So we said, okay, if private sector believe they can invest, 
what will be the role of government? The role of government is to provide the enabling environment. And what are those enabling environment? The government is tackling power. We don't expect that if you want someone to come and build a hospital, it should be the one also generating electricity. It's going to be very expensive. So power. What about water? Government is doing something on water. What about uh, regulation? We are making a regulation. This is where you register. These are the standards and so on. Okay. Now, are there things, what they call incentives, that we can give to you? Now, we have set up a committee um, under uh, Mr. Tony El Elumelo recently. It's a very high power committee, but it's not government committee as it were. And they're working hard. People who experience it, from all, even not just Nigeria, but from even outside the country, those who are Nigerians, we invited them, they are serving. And what we want them to do is come up with this kind of package of incentives, which we take to the Federal Executive Council. I said, this is what we take, we should do. And they're working hard on that. Apart from that, we have the uh, uh, private public sector uh, health alliance, which is made of people like uh, Jim Ovia, uh, Tony Elumelu, uh, Dangote and Co. Many people in the private sector, corporate bodies, individuals, we're working with them. They're also doing work along that basis. And whatever is their recommendation, we'll look into them and see the ones we can implement. But what is important is that the president says he's challenging the private sector. Can they even start with at least six world-class private-owned specialist hospitals? And people are coming on board now. On the part of government, we've entered into a number of MOU. For instance, the one we enter with GE, uh, General Electric, which is a very big uh, global uh, company. And already quite a number of Nigerians, both in the diaspora and in country, have been meeting with GE to work out how they're going to establish must, these uh, centers. I must thank you, Honorable Minister, thank for you. coming on our program. Thank you very much. Next on our program today is In Your Own Words, and our guest is Dr. Okwesileze Ngodo, former governor of Enugu State and former chairman of the PDP. You were one of the founders of the PDP. What significant role experiences that you have as secretary of the PDP? Uh, when we formed PDP, we felt that um, there were two political parties in Nigeria, the military and the civilians. And in order to move Nigeria forward, we felt that we should form an all-inclusive political party where all the civilians, okay, come now, let's not fight ourselves. Let us come together and make sure that there is no more military coup in Nigeria. Let us internalize democracy. Two, we felt that this country had so much resources, both human and material resources, that no Nigerian is entitled to go to bed hungry. If we plug all the loopholes in government and use the resources of this country wisely, no Nigerian should go to bed hungry. Now, um, we, we, we went into troubled waters because um, a lot of uh, politicians still see politics as a means to an end and their own end, not as, not as a vehicle for service. And when people felt that what I was trying to put in place would not would not support their individual aspirations, they decided to fight me. Because uh, as National Secretary, I didn't do contracts in any government in Nigeria, any, any PDP government. I will not take contract from any governor. And I will not visit any governor except it was on an official trip. Because I didn't see myself supervising a second tenure election when I have been collateralized by a governor who was not performing, but because he gave me contracts and he's giving me uh, Ghana must go, then I will now forge result for him to go for a second term when there were better candidates who would uh, defeat him in a primary election. So the, 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 the governors who didn't do their work but desperately wanted to hang on to second term because of the money they were making were more interested in getting this stubborn secretary out of the way. Was, was that a problem between you and Chimaro Kennamani? Chimaro Kennamani wanted to have a vice hold 
on the party. And he excluded the founding fathers of the party from the party. The Jimmo Budos, the Mudo, even as a Southern National Secretary, and everybody, Dube Monya, everybody was excluded from the party. And he ran the party in the streets with um, manpower that I would say is the 10th 11 of the manpower we have in Enugu State. So the, 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 the disagreement was on principle for you? Principle. Not in personal? No, I have nothing personal with him. <laughs> but uh, because there was those rumors that uh, you were not getting as much money as you wanted from him. I don't even want. I never asked him for a penny. I never went to a contract in his state. I don't want anything from him. But at what point did Obasanjo get into the... Into Obasanjo got into this because Obasanjo wanted a third tenure. He started thinking about third tenure early in the administration. You mean from day one? I'm being honest to you. I work closely with him. Obasanjo felt that the, the, the presidents he met when he came back in Africa were not smarter than him. And they've been there all this and while. And been there all this while. And that he had more to offer than those who came after him when he left. So, so he wanted... Is it, is it what you call a messianic? Yes, he felt he was here to save Nigeria. And he wanted to stay there for life, to be able to save Nigeria. I will tell you, he has, um, he has, uh, he has, he has capacity for work. Even as a medical doctor, I used to warn him and caution him about his workload. He has capacity for work, but he was so militarized. His whole body was military. There was nothing democratic about uh, OBJ. We were permanently settling quarrel between him and the National Assembly. Permanently. I would go to OBJ's house and he would tell me, uh, Mr. National Secretary, tomorrow you push should be ready for trouble. I said, how can we be ready for trouble, Mr. President? President can't cause trouble now. President should be settling trouble. He said, that's your business. Tomorrow he'll go to the National Assembly and tell them that he doesn't know their salary. They fix anything like they like and pay themselves. And he's saying this in front of uh, the, the, the media. All, all, uh, not only media, but visiting the heads of states. And then the boys will, will get annoyed. And I'll go and tell Naba, I say, look, if you impeach this man, and in the process of trying to impeach him, this enterprise collapses. <laughs> Before you go to military school and become a second lieutenant, <laughs> Uh, I don't know whether you will see the kind of corridors of power you're seeing now. So let us manage this man. He has been president, uh, head of state, he's now president, he has nothing to lose. Let us manage him and manage this democracy. This thing is not going to collapse in our hands. I will go to his house. I will take the members of the, the leaders of the National Assembly, I will be going to their house one by one, begging them not to impeach Obasanjo. Because he meant well. But, but in a democratic setting, the thing has a system. Mm -hmm. And to, to pin him down, to follow the ABCD of the democracy, OBJ didn't have that uh, patience. Did he at any time tell you he was pissed with you? Oh, if you ask OBJ today, he will tell you that I was the best secretary that the Nigerian politics has ever had, but that he can't tolerate, he can't stand me because I'm independent-minded. You know, because he, he, he gives the order eh, and he his commander-in-chief, just like obey. <laughs> Don't ask any question. That is where, where my problem with OBJ started. As far as my work as National Secretary was concerned, he would give me 100%. But when he says what he wants, it should be implemented without question. And I am not a zombie. So that's where we, we parted ways. And for everybody who had an independent mind, OBJ will hack you down or, or get you out of the system. And this is what happened. And in the Southeast, for example, the leadership that emerged in PDP is the 20th level of the leadership of Igbo land. Under him? Under him. All those that we, we revere to as our leaders in Igbo land, they were totally marginalized and they were the founding fathers of PDP. You know, some of us wondered what they had done to you that was so, that got you so angry, 
that you not only left as party secretary, you left the party and went to contest election in other parties. Because the principle that I was trying to enunciate, they didn't want. And without those principles, there was no level playing ground to contest even uh, councillorship in PDP. So why did you come back? Why did you come I back, and, back, I mean, uh, I came back in 2010, 2011? Yes. Why? I came back. Number one, OBJ was no longer president. Okay. Number two, Chimaroke was no longer governor. Number three, Obula, for my childhood friend, was now national chairman. And in Enugu, my, my boy uh, was a state chairman. I could work with these people and I felt I could influence them to drive the thing back to where we started the, the, the journey. And I would be doing myself a disservice if the people who are running PDP now are people that I could influence and I stayed out. And look at, uh, I never met, uh, I never met uh, the president, Yaradua, even as national secretary for three years, I never met him. But in his wisdom, he considered it good to give me a national honor, CON. And then in his inaugural address, he said he condemned the election that brought him to power and set up the Waste Committee. I said, no, wait a minute. These are people that we can work with and change this country. That's why I came back to PDP. And then, and then um, you became chairman. And you came with this blueprint of what you wanted to do. What went wrong? What went wrong again is the same thing that went wrong the last time. The governors felt that I was too strong. A governor wants to come to you and give you a list of those who will be senators from his state, House of Rep, House of Assembly. And maybe with a gift to make sure that you accept his list. And I said, no, we have to have internal democracy. We have to have a level playing ground. The only way Nigeria will harvest her first 11 to run this country is a level, a level playing ground. ground. But some of the governors accused you of uh, being so aloof and uh, you were talking down on them. I was not like when you said um, that you didn't want any one of them to come to your house, mm. they shouldn't visit you and, and things like that and that you didn't carry them along. Maybe it is an opportunity even to explain how that thing came about. One of the governors fought my nomination as national chairman even in the courts. And when I became national chairman, he, he sent me a convoy of vehicles for my official use. And I said, no, the party has already bought me my convoy. I don't need this. He said, okay, take it to your village and leave it there. I said, in my village, my father has a house that has 19 bedrooms. And he's dead. My mom is dead. My brothers and sisters, we only go there during Christmas. So that uh, palace is housed by cockroaches and rats. And then I go and give, a, give them a convoy again. They have not finished living in the 19 rooms. I, 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 don't, need the, I don't need the convoy there. Uh, so you, 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 you wanted to stop me from being chairman. And immediately I was chairman, you came with this, your gift of... Uh, <laughs> so I was so upset, but I, I managed to control myself. So I was addressing the press in, um, in Lagos. And you know, like you're talking, you get carried away. And this whole picture just replayed in my mind. And the pressures they were bringing to just have one man nominate the entire political leadership of the state. And I was shouting on TV and everywhere about level playing ground, about internal democracy. At that point, it just, it just, it just, I, I, just, I, just I just let it go. Do you regret saying that? I don't, uh, regret it in a way. Uh, it, was, it was an outburst of my, of my genuine feeling. But the way it came out, some of them who were good, felt that I had condemned all of them, that they were corrupt. And, and to those people, I owe a lot of apology because all of them are not, are not corrupt. Some of them are doing very good jobs in their state and will win a re-election any day as many times as possible that the constitution allows them. But some were just, just 
there to, 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 to embezzle state funds and do nothing. Some people say that if, if you were as democratic as you wanted people to believe, you would have had a better rapport with your executive and I would have stood with you all that period of trial. That because you were running the PDP at that time like a chief executive officer, there was a crack. Well, I, I, about my executive, let me say that even when I became chairman, one of the things that was on the table is that my executive should be removed so that I'll have a clean slate. A clean slate. And I said to the president uh, that I don't think it's necessary. I said, all my life I've been able to work with anybody. I can work with anybody. And um, I don't want anybody removed. Do you regret that action? I think it was the, the number one and the gravest mistake I made. Because everything I did to carry them along, everything I did to carry them along, they were still very stiff in their old ways. Okay? Even when they believed me, it was difficult for them to come along with me. And um, until we begin to do those things that we must do, <laughs> this country is in trouble. There was one policy you were trumpeting when you came. Um, automation. Uh, the computerization membership, of membership uh, and what have you, registration. which I thought was a great idea, but you chickened out. I mean, it was it, the, the day that policy was shut down at the National Executive Committee, that was the day that I almost lost hope for this country. This is something, <laughs> I tell you, when I was National Secretary, I mentioned this thing to Tom Mbeki, and he requested Obasanjo to release me for, for, for one month to come and do it in South Africa for ANC. And why, why on earth will anybody oppose e-registration if only you have no confidence that you can win your primary based on your performance? Because e-registration allows every member of the party to be able to vote at the primary with a biodata membership card that can only be him and him alone. And it, 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 for the first time, for the first time, a political party was going to harness the entire fund it needs to run its affairs without looking forward to any government or the central government to finance the party. The party will be genuinely independent from the national to the world level. And they fought it. Because the man who pays the piper dictates the tone. People want to hold on to the party structure as a private enterprise. Okay, um, when you were secretary, you had issues with Chimaro Kenamani. When you became chairman, you had issues with uh, Sullivan Chime. And people were wondering, was it you? Were you the problem? Or were they the problem? Or was it the system that was the problem? I think every, every, every uh, governor at this stage of our development, as I, I keep saying, they wanted the easy way. So what was the problem and, with, and with uh, Sullivan Chime? Sullivan, people, I mean, I had, I had meetings with Sullivan and I said, you are doing well. You have changed the landscape of our state capital. Anybody who has not been in Enugu, who comes into Enugu, feels the change. You have tied almost every nook and cranny of the state. Even on that alone, you are re-electable. Two, many of us are supporting you because you distance yourself from the government of Chimaroke and Namani, which many of us fought that was not doing well. Your problem is that you want to carry all the baggage of those who are not performing. Leave everybody to go and do primary. And those who are doing well will come back. Those who are not doing well, if they fall out, let them fall out. And those people ganged up around him and said, 
look, we are a team. We must go together. You can't leave us alone. I said, you are listening to these people. They will drag you down to their level. So the problem was not Sullivan? The problem was, I never had problem with Sullivan. Who was my candidate for a governorship of Enugu State? Who did I finance? Who did I promote? I asked Sullivan this question in front of the Bishop of Enugu. I asked him in front of uh, uh, the Mr. President. Who is my candidate? Who, who, is, who, who do I want to put to replace you? I don't think that till tomorrow he has been able to answer that question. Why did the problem linger? Because I know that there were a lot of peace parties, Mr. President, the Catholic Mr. Church. Mr. President intervened seven times. President intervened on Enugu matter seven times. Was it because you stood by, I mean, you stood your grounds, or that the governor stood his grounds, that there wasn't going to be a rapprochement? You know, first of all, we wanted to, we wanted to uh, democratize the party in Enugu based on uh, orders from INEC. INEC said eight states, they don't recognize their executive. And these eight states, we must go and do primary, I mean, uh, do fresh congresses. Enugu was one of them. Before this time, I was already asking the governor, let us find a way of doing it in our states to be as hitch free as possible. And the more I was convincing him, the more he was listening to people who wanted to hold on to what was there for their personal interests. So when this uh, INEC thing came out, it became difficult. It means we must have to do the Congress. That also fueled the matter. And these people, they're, 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 you know, you have conference of governors. And once you are trying to do the right thing in one state and the governor feels that he's it's, uh, getting the rough end of the thing, he shouts to the governor's forum and then they gang up. And then the president was a president who was a candidate and who needed the governors for his election. So he was extremely under pressure from the governor's forum. And these people with? felt that I was, I was pushing too hard. The governor said, all these things I'm saying are very nice, but let me wait till after the election. <laughs> what does that say <laughs> of, of Mr. President? Well, this is politics. You play to win. Okay? I, I, I don't blame the president for uh, finding his own formula to win his election and, and, and become president. They say politics. Yeah, they say politics. All, all is fair. Look, we are not talking about the chairman of PDP, man. We are talking about president of Nigeria. And if you put two of them on the table, the president of Nigeria has to go first. So that was a more important project. And that's why I had to resign, so that he can go on. Otherwise, if I stay and keep fighting the governors then they, 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 they think that the president is, is the one who is encouraging me. Then they will fight the president. Okay, um, someone said that the court uh, judgment, which allegedly uh, put your position in peril, <laughs> was never published. Is that true? Never been served till today. And my lawyers went to court, you know. They told the court that the court was biased. And they, they told the, the judge why he was biased and how he had be benefited personally from the governor of our state. They told him that the day he was sitting on my matter, he would have been sitting on a tribunal, and he didn't sit on the tribunal. They told him that um, that particular day was, uh, uh, I think uh, there's a day the, the lawyer set aside, uh, a legal uh, week or whatever, and that day no court was sitting in Enugu. He decided to sit. They pointed out all these things to him and said, look, you are biased. Two, you have no jurisdiction. This is a federal matter. We're talking about chairman of PDP in Nigeria. We're not talking about a local government party chairman. You have no jurisdiction on this matter. Everything that was said that gave, that ruled him out of order to, to continue with this matter, he violated them completely and was compromised to give an order which he had no authority to give, and till today has not served it on me. 
A lot of people say <laughs> you didn't have to hastily resign since you knew that there was lack of jurisdiction, you had not been served. So why did you have to resign? I had to resign to let the party move on. We're in the middle of an election. Was it because of the speech you made at the, at the convention? Yes. The, 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 first of all, the, those who trumped up this thing said I shouldn't have even come to the convention. And somebody who is very high up in this government and whose job it was to see that that injunction was discharged told me that morning, right in this house, that the injunction has been vacated. I was not prepared to go for the convention. I told the president I was not coming. And when he told me it was discharged, that I should go back, go down to Eagle Square and take, take care of uh, proceedings. I quickly, without having a bath, dressed up and rushed to that place to read my speech. And then when I did, then the conspirators turned around and said that I came to, to preside over the convention so that if Atiku Abubakar wins, uh, I mean if uh, uh, Jonathan wins, Atiku Abubakar can have grounds to go to court to avoid the convention because somebody was not supposed to preside, presided over. And that Abu Bakr, that Abu Bakr gave me money. Of course, I think I Abu Bakr and his campaign organization, they even told the country that I was refusing to take their phone calls, I refused to have meetings with them and so on and so forth. But that was really what happened. Um, we put all this behind us because the important thing for me at that point was that uh, stubbornly remaining as national chairman was not in the healthy interest of the party that was in the middle of an election. Do you have regrets about what happened? None at all. If I have an opportunity, I will do exactly without uh, mission what I've done before. I will fight for internal democracy, which is the only thing that can bring true leadership in Nigeria. I will fight for a level playing ground all my life as a politician. I will fight for equity. I will fight corruption in all its ramifications as long as I play an active role in politics in this country. Dr. Kweslezen Wood there sharing his thoughts with us. And now to our parting shot. Condoleezza Rice, an American, was a former national security advisor to the president George W. Bush, and later on Secretary of State under that administration. And she entitled her memoir of her public service, No Higher Honor. The title of that best-selling book was what came to my mind last Tuesday when the South African Reserve Bank rolled out new notes bearing the face of the country's first black president, Nelson Mandela, the latest monument to the 94-year-old anti-apartheid icon. What a life. A prisoner will remain true to his beliefs in the midst of extreme suffering. A president will remain true to his beliefs in the midst of extreme grandeur, served his term, and bowed out when the ovation was loudest. Because he fought a good fight and has continued to live an exemplary life of leadership, the ovation has refused to die down. From the ends of the earth, Awards and honors are tumbling down just because this once-in-a-generation legend has remained true to his beliefs. Indeed, no higher honor of a man who has given so much for his people and the world. That's Frontline for today. Frontline returns same time next week. Thanks for watching. I am Obiora Ilo from Abuja, Nigeria. <laughs>